This episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. It's a meaningful gift that you and your family can treasure forever. Get started right away with no shipping required by going to storyworth.com slash gems, and you're going to get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash gems. Welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 257. I am Lisa Louise Cook. And in this episode, we are going to be visiting the Internet Archive. It's a free website that strives to archive the internet, hence its name. (laughs) And within that massive collection of material that it is archiving from online, you can find a lot of genealogy materials as well. So in this episode, I'm going to share with you 10 genealogy records that every genealogist needs that can be found right there for free at the Internet Archive. Again, this is episode 257, so you can follow along with the show notes over at genealogygems.com. Go to podcast, to the Genealogy Gems podcast, and click on episode 257. You'll also find a link if you're listening through the app. And uh, we always have everything written up for you. And if you are a premium member, there is also a um, special downloadable PDF cheat sheet for you. So without further ado, let's head to the Internet Archive. Now, if you haven't been there before, it's at archive.org. You got to have a free account. Now, this is fairly new to me because I've been using the Internet Archive for a long time, but without an account. And it turns out there are some great advantages. So the benefits of the free account are um, that you can check out eBooks. And there's a lot of them. I'm going to show you how to get a hold of those. You can also save favorites. And the more you dig in, the more you're going to want to be able to find those favorite items again and again. You can also upload stuff, which is really interesting. If you have something that's very unique in your own genealogy collection, Internet Archive would be an ideal place to upload it and make it available also to other people. And of course, they have recommended websites. So if you would like to recommend a website that you would like to see archived, maybe it's your own family history blog or website, get in touch with them, ask them to archive it. And that way it will be there, copies of it even well beyond uh, the time that you run that particular blog or website. So again, we are at archive.org. So let's jump into our first item. Uh, How about church records? And we covered this very recently with my friend, Sonny Morton. So it got me thinking, of course, right out of the gate, when I went to the Internet Archive to put this together, hmm, could I find some of these church records that Sonny was talking about? Absolutely. I just typed in Lutheran church history, just to kind of get a sense So you could put in any particular denomination, you could just put in church history just to kind of start, kind of play with it and see what works for for what you're in search of. And this is an international website, obviously. So do the same thing. You can put in locations, you can put in the denomination of a church, uh, and you will find all kinds of things. Um, Many old church histories, gosh, there's over 797 results as of yesterday, Um, for that. And then also church meeting minutes. I think these are very cool because even if they have just under 3000 of these, each one is chock full of names and activities and events going on at churches all around the world. So really interesting stuff. Um, Some very unique things And we're going to talk more about kind of who's posting this information and maybe how that could also lead you to finding more stuff. Okay, so our second must have record, and really, I call them records, but it's really just general themes. What's the theme of records that you're looking for? And let's talk about family records. Family records can include many things. Uh, One example would just be going in and typing family history. 
and maybe putting in a surname. Now again, depending on if your surname is fairly unique or very, very common, you know, you could try just the surname. I, as I've mentioned many times before, I have Sparowskis in my family. Well, there's not a lot of Sparowskis around the world. So it's really interesting to me just to put in that family name. That's not going to work so well with Jones, but you get my feel here. We can add Jones and family history. That might give us a little something. Nearly 60,000 hits just on the term family history. You're going to want to filter more. On the left-hand side of the screen, there are ways to kind of filter down on time frame and topics and subjects and also the type of content. So we see a lot of books at the Internet Archive, but we also see other types of text documents, um, images, movies, videos, collection software, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So this is just kind of a general way to dip your toes in there. And let's go for something that um, I learned about really early on in my family histories research back when I was a kid, actually, somebody told me about compiled family history. I don't think these are as much on the radar of today's genealogists, particularly if you've started in the last five or 10 years, because we tend to get kind of focused in on the websites and individual records, and we forget there are people who did a lot of work oftentimes well before we came along, and they've compiled that in a family history. Thankfully, there are many, many of these on the Internet Archive. So again, it does depend on the terms that somebody uses when they upload their information. So if, if an individual person is uploading a compiled family history that they've written up, they might not put in the word compiled. They might not think of it that way. So play with the terms, the na surnames, uh, the time frames, and I think that you'll have um, some good success in finding some really interesting books here. And of course, in Elevens is with Lisa, episode 29, we talked about family Bibles. I hope you watched that episode. To me, it was, it was fascinating to research it and put it together for you. And one of the places we talked about where you can find old family Bibles is over at Internet Archive. So simply putting in this term. Now, you notice what I did this time? I put the quotation marks around family Bible. And we do that over at google.com when we're searching. We're trying to explain to the search engine, hey, we want this phrase. We don't just want the word family and the word Bible. And it turns out that there's kind of no connection, no context with this. We want it to be a phrase so that will really narrow things down, but more importantly, give you a lot better quality results. And you can see, gosh, real old family Bibles. Now, you're going to see different things. You're going to see digitized images of Bibles themselves. People put the Bible down on the table and they started digitizing. But you're also going to see transcriptions. You're also going to see individual pages just from the family history pages in the old family Bible. So they're not digitizing the entire Bible, which of course is huge. They're just doing the pages that families for, for centuries have been writing the births, the deaths, the marriages, the other major events in their family, in their family Bible. Sometimes those pages are found in the front. Sometimes they're in the middle of the Bible. Uh, we click on this one. This is the Streepy Family Bible, and um, they've digitized the pages with the, the actual handwriting. Really, to understand family Bibles, you got to watch episode 29, because we talk about how to really interpret what this means and the validity of it, and uh, do so much more. So I hope you'll check that out. And when you get into clicking a particular item, you can find it. It's really like reading a book. You can click and just flip the pages. This one is a great example of those transcriptions. Somebody later typed up the information they were finding in old family Bibles. And it could be a whole community. It could be from a particular church. It could be just one family and multiple Bibles throughout their family. So lots of different variations. You never know what you're going to find, but it's really um, fun to be able to read it. This one, you don't have to borrow. 
You can just read it right then, turn the pages, you can see the pages. You'll see a kind of a black screen. It'll say preview if it turns out that you can't do it without borrowing the book. So our next item, number three, are location-based records. Wow, this could kind of cover the whole gamut, but what I really wanted to do was get you thinking about what are the locations associated with your family history and what kinds of records would be generated based on the fact that they were coming from one locality. Okay, so let's just start with a place. Uh, I typed in Regina, Saskatchewan, which is where the Cooks immigrated to from Huntington, England, over to Saskatchewan in 1912. And so I've gotten lots of great stuff, all kinds of historical pictures. There's audio I can see, the kind of the audio wave, um, books. I mean, it's amazing I got this prepped for the show because <laughs> I was just going to like, I kept going down rabbit holes. I kept finding things. I would go running into Bill's office. Look what I found. You're going to feel the same way when you dig into this and just start putting some of these locations it's important to get to know the location where your ancestors lived so that you understand the history. What's what's the environment that they're living in and that can impact decisions that they made. Another example of Grunwald in Ortelsburg. Now, this is in East Prussia. My great-grandmother was born there, and I just wanted to see if I could find anything. It was interesting. I got a couple of items, and I got the option, I think it detected that the description of these items was in German. So the Google Translate just kind of popped down and said, oh, do you want to translate this into English? Now, I wish that it would translate the whole book or the whole newspaper. Wouldn't that be amazing? It doesn't. But what it can do is it can translate the text of the description and the title. So at least you know what this document is about, whether it's going to be relevant to your family history and something that you want to dig into further. If you want to learn more about when you find an item that is a match, how do I translate the pages? Check out my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox. We go into in-depth Google Translate in the book. And there's a couple of different ways you can use Translate very creatively to try to get these things translated for you. Okay, so another location in my family, Randolph County, Indiana. I just tapped in the word history to see if, what that would do. It did a nice job of bringing many different documents and books. We have church materials here, historical papers from individuals and branches of libraries, um, history books. So lots to work with. It's really neat to be able to have this kind of variety from around the world available right here from home. Uh, at the Internet Archive, and and maybe even to be able to borrow some of these books. If it turns out that they actually came from a library that you don't have access to, wow, this really helps solve that problem, doesn't it? And another location-based item would be a directory, like a city directory, right? It's all about who lives in the community. City directories are your friends because they fill in all the years between the census records. We know the census is every 10 years when you can go into a city directory and you can see it year by year and you find out what was happening. Why do I see them in 1910, but I don't see them in 1920? We might be able to see more going on and when the move happened. Uh, And also for years like 1890, where the census was essentially destroyed here in the U.S., We've got city directories potentially in the areas where your ancestors lived to help fill in that gap. I was doing a happy dance. Okay, so this is Henderson's Regina City Directory from 1913. And there is Harry Cook, my husband's great grandfather, working, and this was interesting, as a wireman at Northwestern Electric. So that was very cool to discover and kind of validated another piece of information I had found about where he was working. And this kind of put the uh, the icing on that cake. And of course, you can't talk about location without talking about maps. We love old maps and have talked about them here on the show, in particularly using Google Earth. Let's just type in plat map. Now, plat map, right, back in, particularly in the 19th century, we saw a lot of these uh, in our old county histories here in the U.S. This is where they're documenting 
who owns the property at any given time. Now you can click to zoom in. This is the kind of document where you really want to get in up close and they're beautifully, highly digitized, really high resolution. So you can do that. You can zoom in really well. Over on the left hand side, we can even type in some text and we can try to search, although that's not going to work so well on an image, but we can download it. This allows me to download this map as a PDF straight to my computer. We can also do that in the upper right hand corner. Down below, another way to do it, and there's many different types of files. So depending on how you might want to use the map, maybe there is another version that you want to get. It comes from this collection. It's part of the Wisconsin History Collection. Don't miss this. Okay, when you find a great record, go down below, they're going to give you like a little timeline feeder that shows you other items that might be lined up with what you're looking at. And you can also click through to the collection that it's part of. So think of it like that thread, we're just pulling that thread to see where it leads us or unravels us. So use these links and recommended related items as a way to bring you more easily to other content that is also in the uh, arena that you're interested in. Okay, number four. Oh my gosh, can you believe there's this much over at the Internet Archive already? We are just getting started, my friend. Okay, number four is school records. And there's just like church records or anything else, there's a lot of different kinds. How about a student newspaper? I think these are so interesting. Again, one document, but really chock full of all kinds of names and details about everyday life at that school. So if you type in student newspaper, then you can start using the filters and maybe do a little more filtering down. We can add in the name of the school. Um, we could put in just the town. Because, you know, we don't always know when the name of a school changed or the name of the newspaper changed. Maybe you are familiar with one issue of a newspaper and you want to see if there's more. Use that title, but then also go back and just do student newspaper and the town and see if by chance that name changed over years. I've seen that a couple times in my own family history. So uh, that way you don't miss anything. When you click through, it reads just like a book again. We've got that paging to the right, to the left. We can look at side-by-side -side pages, we can do individual and zoom in, we can, um, in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, we could click that checkerboard, just like in Google Books, it's like a thumbnail view. So it gives you a chance to kind of get an overview of how much is here, are there pictures, are there maps, uh, is there an index or a table of contents? So much faster to spot that kind of stuff if you click that checkerboard thumbnail button in the bottom right hand corner of the viewer. Do that first, get your bearings, and then dig into the paper. And of course, these also can be downloaded most of the time. And yearbooks, just putting in the name of the school, Rock Creek High School, we got 20 yearbooks. Now there might be more than one Rock Creek, but we can go through these pretty easily. We can also use the filters to thin them down if we need to. Certainly, all of the items we're talking about, absolutely, they can be found in many different locations. What I love about Internet Archive is just the wide range, the ability to make them favorites, um, to borrow items that maybe weren't available or just were preview over somewhere else. It's just one more wonderful, rich resource with so much variety. And, and they do have these mechanisms to help lead you to other related items, which I just think helps kind of open up the research for you. We'll continue on our top 10 list right after this. I'm close with my dad, so naturally we talk a lot. I can probably tell you what he's up to right now. But even though our relationship goes back my entire life, there are aspects of his life that don't come up in day to day conversation. I wanted to learn more about my dad in a way that's tangible. And that's why I gifted him StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps a loved one share stories through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. 
The way it works is every week, StoryWorth emails a different story prompt. These are questions that you've never thought to ask, like, what's one of the strangest things that has ever happened to you? And uh, what's a small decision that you made that ended up having a big impact on your life? And I can even add my own questions too. StoryWorth is a meaningful way to record your loved one's stories in their own words. And there's no shortage of surprises. I'm constantly learning something new. Like the fact that when my parents first got married, my dad was not only a full-time student, but he also worked a full-time night job at the state mental hospital. I never knew that. And my gosh, the stories that he has to tell. And after one year, StoryWorth will compile every story, including photographs, into a beautiful keepsake book that's shipped for free. And you can order multiple copies for your siblings, your children, or other relatives. I love knowing that dad's stories are being captured and how easy this makes it to share the stories of this hardworking man with generations to come. And in addition to the stories, what I really love about StoryWorth is that it does give you the freedom to embellish the book with old family photos. And I've been doing a lot of digitizing lately. So I'm really happy to have a project where I can use these photos. And it's so easy to add them. And I love the idea that with StoryWorth, we can get these stories finally recorded. I know it's made my dad feel appreciated. StoryWorth is a meaningful gift that you and your family can treasure forever. You can get started right away with no shipping required by going to storyworth.com slash gems. That's G-E-M-S. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash gems for $10 off. And now back to our top 10 list for the Internet Archive. Number five are records related to your ancestors' work. Um, I always think these are really interesting. And one of the really cool things you don't run into every day are these trade journals. And Internet Archive has a lot of different trade journals. So you could put in the term trade journal. Um, You could first start by searching for location and then go from there. But they list a lot of people in here a lot of the businesses they were associated with, uh, activities that were going on, super interesting. So they were listing like, there's apartments for rent. So you're coming to work here, you want to be in this trade in this town, here's where you might want to go live. So pretty cool items. How about the CCC? This is known as the Civilian Conservation Corps. I'm sure many of you have at some point heard about some ancestor who uh, worked through this program for a period of time. Yes, there are items for the CCC over at Internet Archive. Now, when I first started, I put in CCC, and that, of course, got all kinds of stuff that had nothing to do with it. Go ahead and put the name in. You could even try and then put quotes around it, um, play with it a little bit, maybe add a location. But there are some neat items here and also, again, quite a variety. So we see photos, but we also see uh, audio and video interviews with people who worked with the CCC back in the day. Uh, Along that kind of lines is the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. My grandfather worked with them uh, back in the 1930s, I think. And so this is actually how this kind of got this train of thought got on my mind was I started thinking about him and trying to find some things. He had worked on Hoover Dam And there were several items, I mean, a couple of thousand items here, just under Works Progress Administration. If you know there was a particular project they worked on, then you might want to try and put that project name and then just put WPA. So you might get something different. We're really relying on the knowledge of the person who's digitizing it and getting it onto the Internet Archive to tag it properly, put in the right metadata, use the right terminology, and spell it correctly. I know, they, they have so much on their shoulders, but you know we have to kind of give them a little bit of wiggle room and come at our searches in a couple of different directions so we don't miss stuff. It's amazing what's out there and what, how fortunate we are that so much of it is available online now. Okay, number six, military records. Now, this is not your first place to go for military records. Certainly some a website like fold3.com would be or something like that. But there are 
interesting and unique items here. So one, now this came to me because one of my listeners of the podcast, um, she wrote me and she said that I think it was her great uncle. I'm not sure I, off the top of my head, but she had written and said that they had been part of this American Forces Network. And it was like a radio show that they did. So we did some searching and found some audio from the episodes that she that uh, her relative had been a part of. So that was really amazing. And if your grandfathers or um, grandmothers were in some way involved in World War II or that type of thing, they might have been on a show. They might have been interviewed. They might have been part of a, a group that was being highlighted. They may have been singing as hers was. Go in and just type in American Forces Network. And you'll find many different kind of items. Something else I thought that was really interesting was going back to thinking about location in conjunction with military. So I didn't know what the right military terms would be to look up information about Bill's father's service in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, During World War II, he was in the Navy. So I thought, okay, well, the Aleutian Islands, that's a pretty unique place. So I could put that in and start there and then see. So I started there with Aleutian Island. Then I went to the filter over on the left. And a lot of times you'll always see 2010, 2009, 2008, and you'll think, oh, it's all new stuff. Click more. There's a little link called more at the bottom of that section. And you'll find there may be a huge screen full of all the different dates that you can select. So I went through and I just selected that kind of World War II time frame and a little bit after just in case there were reporting about uh, the activities in the Aleutian Islands during that time. And I got a nice eclectic mix of really unique information I've not seen other places. Um, I've seen one of the newsreels, I think I saw it over at Ancestry, but they have other ones here as well. And one of them even mentioned the ship that Bill's father was a member of. So really cool. Think about different ways. I can't stress it enough on how you're going to search for this stuff. Don't be afraid to use those quotation marks. I like trying both. Put them on, take them off, see what the difference is. And then sometimes you just have to kind of do that foot search where you kind of walk through and browse through each item to look more specifically. Here, they have this huge collection of the Veterans Administration pension payment cards. Where do these come from? How come they're on the Internet Archive? They're there because of the folks over at the Allen County Public Library Genealogy Center. And you'll remember Allison Singleton was here on the show in episode 31. So they use Internet Archive as a place to kind of host the content. So it takes you know money and time and space to host all this stuff. So put it on the cloud. That's what I mean by hosting it. So they get the digitization going. And sometimes the Internet Archive will help them, and then they will host it on their servers, which, of course, takes up a lot of space. Here's what's interesting about this. I was excited about telling you about it because there are just tons of rolls of microfilm that have been digitized and page by page and tons of names. In looking at it, Internet Archive probably isn't the best place to actually search these. I tried. So we have to think about this in this way. If you run into content on Internet Archive and you look at it and you think, well, this is fine, but I can't find the role with the M's. That's what I was trying to do, finding Mansfield. Well, the way they labeled, the way they titled their files, they almost all look the same, right? And the unique information about what section of the roles that they were doing was way at the end where you can't even see it. You have to click through every time. It became really totally inefficient to do it that way. So and I tell you this because be aware, yes, there's lots of stuff like this. And if you've got time on your hands, you could do it. But in this case, as I got frustrated and realized this is not so easy and I, I'm not finding a way to narrow this down so I can see which one to click without taking up tons of time, I then look to see who sponsored this. 
and it was Allen County Public Library. Well, that's your clue. Go check out their website. Chances are, if you're finding a big collection like this at Internet Archive, it's probably also available through the website, and the website has a lot more incentive to make sure that it's usable, findable, searchable. So that's exactly the case. It's going to be easier to comb through information over at their, at the sponsoring website, let's say, the folks who said, here's our materials, let's get them digitized and online. Their website's so much better to do this, to, to try to find it. So it's not you. It's just a matter of understanding how did it get there? Why is it in this format? And maybe it's somewhere else. This is my clue that these are available but this might not be the right place to be really digging in for a specific search. I'm going to go back to the sponsor, the Allen County Public Library, and see if I can get a better search mechanism over at their website. Okay, keep that in mind. It's not you. I spent some time getting frustrated with that. So but it's a really cool collection. Number seven, this one is one that uh, you read about in my book, because Google has a Google patents collection, correct? Well, I thought it was interesting that Internet Archive does as well. When you're looking for unique records like a patent for an invention or something that somebody is working on, uh, it's nice to know that there are a couple of different options of places to go. If you don't see it at Google Patents, come check out Internet Archive because you might find it here as well. And you might find items that are unique at either location. So we think of it as focus on the record collection and then have your your um, assortment of different places to go look for those items. So very unique. They have um, all kinds of different ones. Some of them are very recent. Some of them go way back. They all come from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So uh, gosh, look at this 409,000. That's a lot. All right. So, and you know, something to think about with patents is that you don't have to have an ancestor who's the inventor. They could just be an associate, a sponsor, um, you know, that kind of thing. So they could be named in a patent. If you know they were working in a particular industry or involved in the early stages of um, a particular invention, it might still be going and worth looking up that patent to see if by chance they had even more involvement. Number eight, this is a genealogical record collection that we see quite often uh, in many different locations, probate records. These are the records, of course, generated at the end of a person's life, and Internet Archive has some unique probate records. So not a lot, but I want to just kind of get it on your radar that if you're really struggling and you and you feel like it's out there, but you haven't found it somewhere else, it's worth a shot. Go check the Internet Archive because it's free. So you might as well go and see. And it's it is you got a few minutes. It's kind of some interesting reading, even to read the the probate records sometimes of people who were well known in a particular community where your ancestor was very involved. Like I think about Winthrop, Minnesota. So Bill's great-grandfather um, was the mayor. He was the census enumerator in Winthrop. Um, he was very involved. He had a business. But it's also interesting to see the probate records of other people from that town because sometimes they mentioned him. They said, we owe L.J. Larson money from the hardware store, so some money needs to go there, you know, that kind of thing, or property. So it's interesting to read sometimes these probate documents from the community at large. Um, there are some here, it looks like Essex, Massachusetts, if that's on your radar is one that you need there. They certainly have them right here. Just kind of putting on your radar that my goodness, there's such a wide range. And when you click through thumbnail button, I mentioned to you. Now remember that's in the bottom right hand corner of your viewer. It looks like a checkerboard. We click that and we get a nice kind of quick overview to see what kinds of information might be listed. This happens to be an index. And it goes way back, 1731. So this is indexing the probate records for the county. So this could lead you to then being able to track down your ancestors' specific records because these indexes are on Internet Archive. 
We'll wrap up our top 10 list at the Internet Archive right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full-service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. The MyHeritage DNA Kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. All right, it's time to get back to the remaining items on our Internet Archive Top 10 list. Gosh, we're getting already towards the end, but this is one of my favorites. It always is um, audio and video, and that is our ninth really interesting records over at the Internet Archive. They have a ton of audio and video. Now, it's not always the easiest to dig into, but I think you might be surprised how often people in your family somehow turn up in this stuff. It's not as unusual as you think, because if you think about it, everyday people are involved in lots of different things, and they might be staying in the background. They might have been um, interviewed as man on the street, you know, by the local radio station or TV station. Here's just a kind of a a quick little um, overview of just some of the kinds of things you can find. So this first one, now this is just audio. So this is somebody has taken old, you know, reel to reels, and then we had cassettes, and I don't even know if people ever record onto eight track tape, but they've digitized the audio and put it here. And this one, now this looked to me like it came from a library. Yes, the the Boynton Beach City Library Local History Archives. So this was an oral history interview done in 1992, but it was somebody who was born in 1909, Leslie Burdick Crane. And you can click the play button, just like you do with the podcast over at my website, and listen to him tell his story. I love seeing when the people who upload this information take the time to put in all these details. It's that text that makes things findable. So when you're thinking about putting old home movies on YouTube, uploading family history information to Internet Archive, keep in mind, people can't search on what he's saying in the audio. They're totally relying on the text that you associate with your item. So if you want to help people find your stuff, you got to put lots of great details, name, date, place, uh, time frame, all that kind of stuff. Anything that somebody might be searching on that makes you notice it yourself, right? As you're searching, it's like, oh, if they would just put the name of the town or the last name, I would be able to find more information. So be thinking about that if you're trying to share your stuff. I hope you are sharing a lot of your family history. You probably have other people's family history in yours. Also here, there's tons of old radio shows. These are kind of fun. Now, I don't know if your ancestors were ever part of the radio shows, but I just like listening to them. (laughs) It's very relaxing on a Saturday afternoon. I'm, you know, cleaning the house or something. Here's Texas Rangers. Oh my gosh, there's tons and tons of old radio shows. I had some fun. My grandfather, I was looking through an interview I did with him. We used to write letters. So I would write him questions and he would answer. And he would tell me about his favorite radio programs and his favorite songs. And I have been able to find so many of them right here on the Internet Archive. And this is a really fun way to introduce uh, the next generations in your family to what was entertainment like on a 
cold, cold morning with nothing else to do or school is closed, you know, what would people do? They would listen to the radio. And um, I just think it's really fun. I I think it's uh, kind of a neat way to give them that experience of what our ancestors would have enjoyed. And speaking of music, I have old reel-to-reel audio of Bill's grandfather playing uh, the violin. He used to play in the silent film orchestra for them at the movies. And one of his songs that we have, we identify, was called I'll See You in My Dreams. And they have a couple of different versions of this audio recording. There is a huge, huge collection of old 78s being digitized and the old cylinders. So remember the old Edison cylinders? Tons of those. And some of those are not just music. They're actually people talking, just people, you know, being interviewed or whatever. And of course, the audio archive, this is just a a small sample of what you might be able to find. Video. Okay, so I I mentioned uh, Bill's great grandfather, LJ Larson. So I went to Internet Archive, and I just looked up Winthrop, Minnesota, and I put quotes around it, and I see this old film. This was yesterday that I was doing this, and I clicked on it, the 1954 Dairy Day Parade. I love that these people, they filmed the front page of the newspaper first to say what was going on and some of the flyers in town, they were having this big event. So yes, I watched the whole thing yesterday. Gosh, some, a lot of it was in color. Lots of people. They just filmed a lot of people. But check this out. Here comes the tractor that says L.J. Larson and Company. I just think that's so cool. So who knows? Your family history could just float by in a video. (laughs) Take some time. And and I I tell you, there were at least two people in this video that I really recognized because I've looked at so many of the family photos as I was digitizing them. And this person, whoever filmed this, did a ton of faces. Many people kind of scurried off. They were so shy. But now I'm really going to have some fun revisiting my photo collection and going back and spotting some of the people here. Amazing. So YouTube is not your only place to find old video, right? Internet Archive is absolutely it. So the final thing I want to mention to you, it's really not a record collection, but well, it's a collections. It's the fact that they have collections on Internet Archive. And this is a wonderful way to more quickly find lots of stuff that you're interested in. So Collections can be that one entity came together, let's say it's Allen County Public Library or a conglomerate of Canadian libraries. They work together and they kind of like have a channel, if you will, on Internet Archive. So these are collections. When you get to the homepage, you'll see the top collections. These are the ones that are getting most visited. But also you'll notice where it gives you the little symbols for the different types of media that they have, text, audio, video, Um, software, pictures. The last one that looks like a checklist is collections. And that's a super easy way to kind of get to the whole series of collections that are available if you click that. Another way you can find them and search by them is to go to the advanced search. So click that. It's always right underneath that search box. And this is a great place to go if you're struggling, trying to find what you want, you've um, done some of the basics like quotation marks, come in here and you can search by collection. So under collection, I just typed in the word genealogy to see what I could find. You can also search for titles and look down below there, date range. You'll notice that when you use the filter, they'll have all these check boxes year by year. It is so inefficient. It just takes forever to check every little box I check. There's no way to like check them all. The way to do it is to get a time frame is to come into advanced search and specify from this year to that year. And you have to give it a month and a date. Doesn't matter. Just put January 1st for the year, but put the date range. So, but here, if I put in, you know, genealogy collection, over 40,000, almost 41,000 items are just in the collection of genealogy. So from there, you could start to whittle down. But it's a nice way to just get oriented to what they have. 
Here's another example of a collection. Now, this is one you've probably heard about, Reclaim the Records. So these folks work really hard to get access to, hard to get access to records and get them digitized and get them up online. And so you could check out the Reclaim the Records collection. American Libraries is a wonderful collection of many other channels. So if you think of them as channels or, or folders within folders, you're going to see the California Digital Library, the Boston Library, the Getty Research. Okay, so get to American Libraries and go through and see if you see a collection there. If you click one, you can go into their specific collection. An example, the San Francisco Public Library has their collection with over 13,000 items. Okay, so this is one of those things where you might have kind of wondered, why, am I, why don't I find much at the Internet Archive? And I think going through collections is a great way to get started. Canadian Libraries has a wonderful collection. And within that one, each one of these libraries has their own collections as well. When you see the little checklist icon, you know you're looking at a collection, not an individual record. And how about newspapers? Oh my gosh, almost 400,000. So get to the newspaper collection. And one of our favorites, got to end with a bang here, Books to Borrow. Okay, so Books to Borrow is a huge collection, over 2 million, and here's how it works. We're going to go in the search box and type in Books to Borrow, click Go. There's lots here that you can borrow, but the very first one has the collection icon on it, that little button. So this is the full collection. Again, the link will be in the show notes. You can click About. It'll explain kind of how this works. And uh, if you need Adobe to be able to read some of the PDFs, that kind of thing. In the collection, we can do a search. I'm going to type in Huntingtonshire. So um, this is a county, an old county in England. And 14 items. I got to tell you, I was, pr- <laughs> I was pretty amazed because some of these books, I've seen them on eBay. And sometimes they're a little expensive. And I'm like, I don't want to pay for that. But it's on Books to Borrow. So when you first look at it, you go, oh, I can't look at it. This is why you need the free account. So make sure that you get signed into your free account and then you can go click borrow. Click borrow for one hour and it tells you, hey, if you need it longer than an hour, click it again. You'll get to borrow another hour. They just don't want you to have it sit on your computer forever and not be available to other people. I found some wonderful, wonderful pictures in here. Again, we can just flip through it like a regular book. We can click our thumbnail view to kind of get an idea. It's all photos and descriptions and little stories of the people who lived in that area. So Books to Borrow is so cool. And you can return it. If you're done, you just click Return Now. And it will tell you that it ends. So if you forget to click Return Now, it's going to end at the end of your hour. But if you need it longer, you can click and Renew. That's it. My gosh, we got through 10 really cool areas of records that you could jump into right now at the Internet Archive. Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 257. Uh, I hope you found some amazing gems over the Internet Archive. And uh, you can find even more over at the Genealogy Gems website. And the best way to stay in touch with us and to hear about all of the new episodes, videos, audio podcasts, articles, sign up for the free Genealogy Gems newsletter. You can do that right from the homepage. And to get the most out of Genealogy Gems, I invite you to become a premium member. Uh, Premium members have access to our premium podcast, as well as all my genealogy classes on video along with downloadable handouts. It's really your genealogy education on demand all year long. And the bonus is you get these free downloadable cheat sheets for the 11s with Lisa video show and this podcast. Thanks so much for listening, my friend. I will talk to you soon.